and welcome, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery. Jeez, I fucked it up already. The open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, creator of the Rapture roleplay system, now a fork of bre a fork of breathless in a in a sense, which <laughs> which we previously covered with Dragon Town, now covering with the Big Red Ugly Edition. The one and only Gregory, no, he does not rap. <laughs> exactly, no rapping here. So, I'm pretty sure you've heard that some you've heard some form of rap joke at least uh, at least once. Oh, it's it's gift rap, is it? Or is it you rap something? Is it you rapping? Uh, oh, I've heard it all. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's great. Oh, it's great! It's great the first couple times. Yeah, and about thirty years later, you're like you've heard them all, right? You know, mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah. So now we have we have dipped into dipped into rapture, though. I don't think at the time we dipped into its or, its origins as a as a breathless inspired um, project. How did you first discover breathless, and what prompted you to, to essentially fork it into Rapture? Yeah, so breathless I found um, by by accident. I was on itch, um, and they had a breathless RPG jam, and so I was like, "Yeah, hey, I'll make something." What the hell, you know? And uh, I was kind of out of ideas, and I was watching the news one night, and I was like, you know, I'll, I'll make this game called Bella Ciao, you know, which is a um, Italian partisan song um, from World War II. And uh, I was watching uh, this Ukrainian grandmother like cleaning an AK-47 and making Molotov cocktails. I was like, that's got to be a game. And Breathless just kind of was sitting on my lap, and I was like, what the hell? I'll use it. And I'll try to turn it into my own. Um, and so Bella Chow came out. And then uh, my good friend uh, Tyler McAllister uh, over at Softcore Anarchy was like, we got to make this game about a city of a billion people. And, you know, you got orc gangsters and elven bankers and like this noir element and all this other cool stuff. And I was like, all right, yeah. And I still had some notes from Breathless. And I was like, oh, I want to make a, a fork of this, you know, a little more in-depth version of Breathless. Because Breathless, to me, while it's a really great system, it, it, to me it fell kind of short of for long-term games. And so Rapture is kind of ratcheting that up a little bit. And so that's that's how Rapture came about. And, of course, everyone's like, well, is it the religious Rapture or is it like happy Rapture? I'm like, whatever makes you feel good. It doesn't matter. It's just it's Rapture. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. you know. And, um, and so the Big Red Ugly... The name itself came from uh, one of our little promotional things that we were doing where we paint, hand painted some covers for uh, for some promo, promo copies and uh, we called it, you know, we're like, yeah, it's big, it's red, it's ugly. All right, it's the Big Red Ugly Edition. And um, we are looking to launch now a year after the fact, uh, the main product, um, which is the core rule book here in June. So a, a year from when we started thinking about, Hey, we want to build our own system based off of breathless. And now we we've got it or we want it. I think, I hope <laughs> so. Yeah. And speaking of that, since, since the, since the name has been brought up, um, why did, why did you go with the name, with the name Rapture? Well, like any like uh, video game buff, you know, I I remember when I first ran into Rapture in a non-religious context. Uh, it was uh, Bioshock, and Dragon Town kind of borrowed some of its magic ideas from Bioshock. You know, where you have to take, you know, inject yourself with something in order to have these magical abilities or magic-like abilities. Um, and so we just ran with it. I was like, yeah, okay. So it's like an homage to Bioshock. It's also Rapture. It's fun. Um, I guess there's a religious connotation some people take with it. You know, it is what it is. But yeah, Rapture to me 
I I was think I was thinking of Bioshock when I when I uh, first came up with the name and it just kind of stuck and didn't go anywhere. I had a lot of other really crappy names for it. Like I was going to do like some, you know, like uh, so you got like Fate and Fudge and GURPS and all these other universal role playing systems. And I'm like I don't want to go that route. That's too to whatever, 290s, 80s, 90s, 2000s vibe. I wanted something that was a little more uh, in your face. Um, and Rapture seemed to be it. So, All right, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, now, to, now taking, that, taking that into account, this particular, this particular core book, what we're dealing... This is essentially... Shifting Rapture into a universalist style of, style affair. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. In a lot of ways, it is. Yeah. Um, except for one thing, I I wanted to make sure when I started developing this this product was not to go the GURPS route, where you roll for every god awful thing, or you have like forty source books just to play a game. Um, and I didn't want to go Fate or Fudge route either, where you know, like some of the rules are just so convoluted. You're like, what the hell is this? And um, I, I love those systems, but sometimes I, I curse at them because I'm like, there's, there's no need for this complexity. And so one thing I wanted to make sure is that it's pretty rules light um, and it's modular. So if there's something that doesn't work with your, say, your setting or your, your game story, you can chuck it, you know, and um, use what you need to. Um, I, I also believe in the, the old school rules, um, or rulings versus uh, rulings, not rules mentality, where if there isn't a rule for it, we don't have to write a rule for it. Let the group kind of figure out what they want to do outside of the baseline mechanics that we give them. Um, so that way there's a little more adaptability. And so that's where it's different, I think, than some universal, um, setting agnostic uh, rule systems like fate fudge and so on so mm -hmm. and to, now with that in, with that in mind mm -hmm. uh, I think it's what made now rapture is a D, is a d6 affair and uh, not not d not d6 what the hell am I what the hell am I thinking Oh, it's all good. Yeah, it's it's, it's a polyhedral. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely used the whole lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's a case of um ha of habit because like the last few, the last few interviews I've done have have been D six systems. Yeah, yeah, that seems to be coming back nowadays. Like everyone wants to just be playing just D six or a D twenty only, right? You know, one die. Not. I'd like to say that's seven. the case. But the thing the thing is 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 that because everyone goes all over the place everywhere all at mm -hmm. once yeah. um it's hard to it's hard to say whether whether that's an actual trend or whether it's being viewed as one selectively yeah yeah that's that's a good point uh the only the only real trend that that i've been that I've been seeing over the last few months. Has been has been people jumping ship to other systems after the whole OGL bullshit. <laughs> yeah, which has been great for business. I'll have to say that I've had probably a tripling of downloads for a lot of our games just because OGL decided to shit the bed with Wizards of the Coast. So it's great. Mm -hmm. Keep on Wizards. Keep keep screwing stuff up. It it works for us. There's a line from Napoleon that I use quite a bit. Never interrupt your enemy when he is making a mistake. <laughs> because well, well, it fits, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Oh. And I, I know some. I know some people are e are easing back on, are easing back on the matter. Um, but not, but not in, but. Um, the I think for a lot of people, the mindset is going to be, well, if you if you. If you if you went all if you went through all of this to try and fuck us last time, what's to stop you from doing it again? <laughs> yeah. Now, 
as 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 I as I understand as I understand it. Um, um rapture the set the setup is is always built on the on the rule of three on the rule of three one to three is a failure four to nine is a, is a complication ten is a ten is a success your skilled proficiency is is rooted is um, linked to the die type yes yes and uh the rule of three was like my way of trying to explain it to my uh niece and nephew mm -hmm. who have never played a role-playing game before and they had to remember you know what's a success a failure and a complication i was like well think of the rule of three and that made it a lot easier for them and um actually visually it looks great too when you put it on a, a nice uh visual in the in the rule book and people are like oh that's really simple to remember like you can't fuck that one up well you can but and then uh um, ba si similar in vain to Breathless, each um, level of the skill goes up based on the die. So you start with a D4 um, and then work your way up. Um, we were also trying to limit some of the math that was going in going into this, uh, so that way you know there's not like a, a thousand modifiers that you're having to keep track of. It's very simple, streamlined. Um, you know that you got to make a ten to succeed. If you got a complication, it's a success of a sort, but some shit's coming your way, and a failure, of course, you know, get ready. It's going to be fun, right? Um, and so we want to make failure and death and other things kind of exciting again in in games, you know. And that's why the rule of three really helps that. Even with like uh, some of the younger kids I've been playing with in my family. Um, they really like the rule of three because it's one, it's simple, and two, they know like, hey, they one to three, they mess up, they know something's coming, you know. So, mm -hmm. and now when it, I've always described com the complication part in narrativist games as but, and yeah. and but in in some cases, though I I get the feeling in um, Rapture, it's more of it's more of but than and. You, you yeah, succeed, you can see it that way. but yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have some success, and maybe the success brings on like you know. I give the example of like uh, hacking into a security system. Yeah, you do really well, but you know, uh, you, you crack into the system, you enter whatever you're entering, and something's on the other side that you didn't account for, you know. And it's just really to try to throw a little bit of chaos at the players, because mm -hmm. that's a lot of fun, you know. Um, players who um, expect everything, I think that that makes the game really boring. But if you keep them on their toes, where they're they're constantly thinking like, "Hey, what's going to happen if I mess up here? What do I need to do?" You know, um, and I think that's that's a lot of fun in, in narrativist games. Um, I think uh, sometimes some games go. A little too far with that, you know. Um, but uh, I don't know. I I liked it. My my players loved it. Um, we've had a, two actual plays with it and several private games in the last few months. That uh, people were like, you know, we were worried about the math component, you know, and we're, and they're like, but the math was the easy part. It's the trying to figure out what's going to happen if I get a complication or if, yeah, I have a success here, but then a failure over here, what does that do to the game and all this other stuff? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I suppose, I suppose one, one particular, um, one particular thing to co to cover is, is, um, there was a degree of granularity when, when I covered when I covered Dragon Town the last time I had you on, is mm -hmm. that something that is some that is somewhat present when it comes to how you when it comes to how you develop? So you mean like with like characters and stuff like that? Yes. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There is a level of the granularity, but uh, what I try to do is um, in the character creation section of the Big Red Ugly, we have a rules light version, of, like I call it, quick and dirty kind of spread at the beginning of the character creation. You can create a character really quickly 
and never have to think about it again. Or you can be like one of those min-maxers who goes through and like, oh, I'm going to put some points toward this and do this and, and have a little more granularity that way. Um, but I try to make it to where it's, it's a, a kind of a modular approach. we got the rules light. you got the, I, I call it the rules light, half crunch and crunch versions of it. So depending on how complex you want your character creation to be and how deep you want your characters to, to go, um, will depend on what you you select. And so rules lights at the the very front of the character creation mm -hmm. chapter. And um, like I said, it's got seven steps. Um, you can do it really quick and be playing within less than 45 minutes with a whole group. Yeah. So, um, something... and then if you, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, you, you go first. I didn't. <laughs> oh, it's all good. Um, I was going to say, as far as like the complex, if you want a really complex character with, a lot of you know um, backstory and all that other stuff. You can do that as well, and that's where the 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 additional parts of that chapter come into play. Um, I try to avoid the GURPS and um, yeah, Fudge kind of had this problem too, where you've got what like 200 pages of skills and advantages and disadvantages and all that so you won't have that in that's in a problem that you that's a problem that you end up seeing a lot in universalist games period you yeah. e you either have the you either have the setup where you're where you're going going extremely light which has its own problems that's the fate route uh -huh. Yeah, or you're go or you're going extre extremely crunchy with the advantages and disadvantages. Uh -huh. Um, neither one is better or worse. Each one of them just has their own consequences that you're gonna have to deal yeah. with. Yeah, exactly. And there's a there's a weightlifting issue, right? So, you know, like fate, I think is pretty light lift for a lot of GMs, but you know, and then you got things like GURPS and. Um, was it Palladium's Rifts is another one that has like a thousand skills that just doesn't need to have, um, where they say heavier lift. And so I want to try to have that middle ground where like, yeah, you can have that light lift, but also if you want a little crunchier game, here you go. Here's the tool. Here are the tools to do so. Um, but yeah, you're right. It is tough for a, a universal game system. You're like, where do I stop? with the, the content creation here and just let people kind of take it on themselves instead of giving them every, like everything that they would possibly need. And then some, you know, so. Mm -hmm. So taking that, taking that into account, one of the things I saw that you were doing that was, that was interesting was putting out articles on Substack regarding customizing mm -hmm. the game. Um, oh yeah. One of the recent ones was how you'd handle how you'd handle magic with um, Rapture, which is definitely going to be one of those elephant in the room situations. And while well, the way a lot of universalist games do magic is um, not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we sp I spent a lot of time going back and forth with Tyler about the magic system, and we finally just came up. We're like, you know, we have to have a role. You know, um, where they you roll to to uh, cast your spell, and there are consequences to that. And I got the idea initially from uh, I don't know if you know Dungeon Craft YouTube channel. I know uh, he mentioned this. Yeah, he mentioned this idea of you know in Fifth Edition Dungeons and Dragons. And this is very true. The magic casters, the caster, spell cast, whatever the hell you want to call them, um, are like the quarterback, right? And everyone huddles around this quarterback as he's like as they're chunking magic out into the open and stuff like that, and there's no consequence, right? And he's like, you know, I, I like to flip that on its head and invert it and to make it to where, you know, um, everyone scatters when the magic user is getting ready to, like, cast, a, you know, like a lightning bolt or whatever. And uh, because, you know, what, it, what happens when they fail? Well, all that magical energy comes back into them. And so that was something we kind of... Uh, thought about is like what are the consequences of magic and then also um something that was inspired by third edition gurps which i think they got rid of it in the fourth edition was uh uh casters can use their health points to cast magic if they run out of fatigue i think is what it was and um and so i thought that would be really cool it's like you could 
barter a little bit with your health. Like, hey, you want some more fatigue points to cast magic spells? All right, go ahead. Here you go. You know, or in in this game, we it's sanity and health points, so they can so they can take two health points, or maybe they take two sanity and uh, get ten fatigue points back. But it's costing them something, and I think that's the problem with fifth edition is that like you can cast and forget. There's no real consequence to magic use, and, and it, you know. It's like the equivalent of messing with a, an atomic bomb, blowing it up, and having no consequences whatsoever, you know. Um, so I think it, it brings a little more consequence to the to the use of magic. It makes players a little more strategic with their resources and all that other good stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, and I, I like the idea of a dice roll too. Like it, it, it progresses similar in similar regards to like a, a skill, although I think it caps out a little higher. Um, and as such, you know, like some spells, you're like, ah, this is a really simple spell. I don't want to spend a bunch of money leveling it up to make it more successful in dice rolls. But like this one's really powerful. And I know if this one fucks up, I'm dead. I better spend some money on, or spend some XP on, you know, developing this one, you know, so that way it's more successful when you cast it. And I think that's kind of fun too. It's, it, there's, a, there's a strategy going on in the back of the mind of the players. You know. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, because I'm I'm pretty sure that in between in between Dragon Town and this, you did a fair few bits of playtesting. What were some of the things that you that you ended up learning from the experience of playtesting Dragon Town? So when we originally play tested Dragon Town, magic was very like. We'll figure it out as we go along, right? And that works to a point, but then you have players who are like, what do I do? Do I just do I just consume this and role play it out? Well, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, and then we started deciding, you know, like maybe we need to add a more mechanical element to it where, yeah, you have to consume something, but at the same time you have to roll to, to see if it's successful. And, and that seemed to work to, one, ease players' minds. It gives them a little bit more control over the narrative. And it also gives them a little bit, more control at least in feeling when they're rolling the die and they they know like if they roll bad it's it's on them you know or on the dice whatever kind of player you have um and so that's what we learned about when we were uh play testing dragon town during um the man with my face uh the magic it was super cool idea but uh, mechanically it was it was lacking in a lot of ways um and a lot of that had to do with we didn't want to repeat some of the errors that we saw in 5th edition with Magic. Um, and that was the lack of consequence and not really having much narrative drive. So Yeah, I've ranted on that in the, pa on the past where uh, Magic is... Where the well for start for starters, D&D doesn't know whether to shit or get off the pot regarding what kind of fantasy it is. <laughs> Exactly, but there's but there's also the there's also the fact that the the limited style of magic that it's trying to use does not fit the the um setting, but not setting that the game has. Yeah, like the Vancian model. If you look at Dying Earth, it's very mm -hmm. sword and sorcery. Magic is not all that understood. Yeah, magic yeah. is not poorly understood in a lot of D and D worlds. Mm hmm In fact Yeah, it's, it's like highly of... studied and yeah, yeah. Yeah. And because of, because of that, it's hard to it's hard to justify that the the whole the the problem that I have is that there isn't a justification for the you've got to prepare your spells in advance and you've got to do an eight hour rest to get your spell slots back. It's <laughs> It's an artifact of the days of chainmail that has that has been hallucinated into the into this tradi into this tradition because of this grand idea that that was present for it, and really that's not the case at all. Yeah. And well, and then oh, sorry, go ahead. I was I just I just I just need to break these sounds. You go you go ahead. I was going to say, for uh, Magic, the other thing we thought of is, 
know, these are like practitioners, right? And so why not make it similar in a skill that, you know, you have to go through an apprenticeship or, you know, like work your way up as a, as a character. Um, that's another thing I kind of like too, is that, uh, I wish D and D had that in a lot of ways where you like your character has to like maybe go train with a wizard or a, a sorceress or whatever and, and add that element of interaction and depth. You know, I understand it in a lot of ways, you know, D and D is like a combat sim that, you play you play in a dungeon or some wilderness area and, and stuff, but people use it so much more than that, you know. So I just wish, you know, those who shall not be named would fix some of the stuff and maybe, like you said, settle on something when it comes to their their magic system and how it interacts with the characters and the world itself. You know what I mean? The funny, th the funny thing about th about that, and the reason why I've res I've um I've realized that they won't fix it is, um, so cer those certain people who know who they are are victims of tradition. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the phrase that we use is is um designed by gospel. We have to do it this certain way because we've always done it a certain way. And if that sounds circular, that sounds like a circular argument. That's because it is. But it's one that can e that you can easily get stuck in when it comes to tradition, especially when that tradition is ill-defined, and even more so when people when a certain segment will re at anything and everything that changes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not I'm not using it to pick to to pick on grogs, but I will use it to pick on people um, who um, are hu who are huffing on nostalgia. Yeah, yeah, they're they're huffing pretty hard on that nostalgia too. You, you can see it on Kickstarter. There's all these nostalgic projects with gaming, and it's cool. Don't get me wrong; it's created some really interesting stuff. But like you said, it's where's the new blood? The new ideas, you know. For me, it's a, for me. It's always a case of if you if you want to if you want to do if you want to do some sort of throwback, that's all well and good. But being a throwback to what came before is not enough. Yeah, uh, I've I've talked in the past about how my one of my my two fa <clears throat> my favorite old school designer is um Craw is Crawford especially through things like uh, Worlds Without Number and Stars Without Number and Godbound. Oh, yeah. And that's because even though he's using old-school D&D as a base, the customization that he has within within the core book uh, shows that he's not limited to that. Um, same thing with Adventure Conqueror King System. It isn't, it isn't as full-on flexible, but it, but it is dedicated to its... It's um focus on the end game and me and um it and how in that you're you're going from just a solo adventure to somebody who's getting followers to somebody who's get a ho getting a holding and more followers. Uh, hence the name. Mm -hmm. Oh, I say the same thing when it comes to the glut of um of action RPG throw throwbacks Diablo likes. Just, yeah, and in all and in all fairness, a lot of the Diablo likes that have come that have been coming around in the in the last few years have been very good. One of them, one of them, you get you get an ass load of content without paying for anything. <laughs> it's funny how that works out, isn't it? Yeah, that that being um, Path of Exile, which it I mean you can you can tech you can technically pay for some for some stuff, but not it, but not as much as not as much as one would think. And with a lot of the other ones, they're, you're not gonna have to deal with um, Blizzard being Blizzard. Yeah, exactly. But point. But give now, given that, and given the, given that this is a more universalist approach, when it came to the magic system, did you guys have debates about? About how to how to accommodate people who want to do, want to do different magic systems than 
the than the one used in the most litigious role playing game. Yeah, so you know, um, one of the problems that uh, I had with magic, and this is my my issue, I have a brain block when it comes to magic. My friend Tyler doesn't, and so when it comes to magic, it has to make sense to me. Like I, I have to like have this logic to it, and so when I set it up originally, uh, in the version you see in the Substack, I was like, this is a very logical approach to it, you know. Um, but what we did is in the optional rule section of the, the the core rule book is offer some alternates. Like, all right, if you don't like this progression, here's some alternates. Like, uh, you might want to make a more narrative base. What are the consequences of this? Uh, and so on. Uh, if you want, like, high-powered magic, all right, uh, maybe cutting down the cost of the progression ladder and so on. And so, and then also you know, expanding out, like, the fatigue system and whatnot. Um, so, it, what, so the core... The baseline mechanic for magic is the one that I show on Substack. Mm -hmm. But I try to offer at least five, six, seven different varieties that taking that same system and, and tweaking it to where they could, you know, do different kinds of magic systems that really fit their needs as a group. Um, nothing's perfect. You know, as, as we were pointing out with Wizards of the Coast, uh, Dungeons and Dragons. But uh, um, I think having a level of flexibility with like an optional rules section is great because what it does is it keeps me from backing myself into a corner and allows me to have a little bit more um, or offer a little bit more to my players who are going to take up this game. Right. So going back again to the rulings, not rules again, offering that, Hey, if the, the referee and their players don't like this system, they can tweak it. That is something we're okay with. And um, I feel like a lot of legacy games and even some newer games, there's this uh, notion like it's in the rules, you have to follow it, or at least some, that's how some newer players see it. And I think breaking that mold a little bit for them helps them develop their own magic system using the tools we've given them. Um, or maybe some tools that they found in another game that's similar to ours, and they can just bring it together. Like I, I remember watching a, a YouTuber who talks about, you know, they they play Dungeons and Dragons, but they have a magic system from like some other role playing game and a combat system from another thing that they played 20 years ago, and they just mash it all together. And that I think that's a cool part of role playing games is that you don't have to stick to the the core rule book. It's great. You know, I'd love them to, but I think also offering that, hey, you know, it's your it's your product. Use it as you see fit. And, of course, that puts me in a dangerous position as well. Like, you know, yeah, maybe they just pirate or take the uh, free copy and just run with it and never look back on the new stuff that Rapture comes out with, and that's fine. But uh, um, I really want to give freedom back to the players and the referees so that way... You know, they can have those enriching experiences that are meaningful to their group, if that makes sense. Because, like, my my idea of magic is very technical. Um, my friend Tyler's, his is very uh, narrative heavy, you know. And so that's what we've been working with is just going back and forth. How narrative heavy do we want it? How crunchy do we want it? And so on. So. Mm -hmm. As for... for... For me, the the approach that the approach that I take is, oh, is it too is it too much to ask for both? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little I'm a little bit spoiled because because of my love for the sphere system, which mm -hmm. which um as far as w which when it comes to the question of how how crunchy or how freeform should should casting be it says, ah, oh, pick one. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to when it comes now, when it comes to the settings that that you've put that you've put in, because there's within the rule book for the Big Red Ugly Edition, as I understand it, you've got a few you've got a few um, settings built in. Yes. Yeah, we do. So um, some of these were pre like standalone games at one point, then we decided just to kind of incorporate them into the Rapture system as settings. So like Bella Chow, where you 
play uh, Resistance Fighter. Apocalypse City, which is like a post-apocalypse, weird uh, sci-fi game uh, setting that we put together uh, that's actually um, located in New Mexico, um, as, a, as the setting goes. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got Danger Zone, which was uh, originally my weird take and homage to uh, uh, Top Gun 1 and 2, um, only because, you know, the, the cheesiness of it and all this weird weirdness that comes with it and i wanted to kind of replicate this uh this um macho alpha dog kind of environment and actually i got a a former pilot who said you know this is what this is what it should be like and, and he actually gave me a bunch of notes that i'm i'm hoping to incorporate into that into that setting as i flesh it out um and um and then of course we've got uh landing days which is a a, a mixture of like 1960s proto RPG playing, you know. I don't know if you've ever watched the the Secrets of Blackmore. I have. Um, they call they call them Braunsteins or Brownstones or any number of names. Um, and they were kind of more free form, um, large group role playing games. And so Landing Zone or Landing Day, excuse me, is uh, kind of a take on that, where it's a hard sci fi setting where your your characters um, in the game are colonists colonizing a, an alien world and it just goes from there it's survival it's hard sf it's a bunch of other things and so the idea is, is the settings not only give like a, a thing to latch onto, but also a possible game mode style like a braunstein or a uh, like a west marches style gameplay um, or even just traditional solo co-op or multiplayer that we're familiar with in our in our games today, and um, really the book is meant to be a one-stop shop for newbies and veterans alike. So you can start playing the system. You have a setting already there that you can steal from. You'll have encounters also in there, locales, you name it, uh, random tables, and um, really just gets you started in the system and then after that you know we'll have i'm hoping um some more focused campaign and setting uh books mm-hmm. so and and that's that's something that i'll be looking forward to and i'm get cool did you did you mention no one owns, no one owns the skies oh yes no one owns the sky is another one that was a rules light uh, game that actually start kind of started some of the the ideas for um, Rapture becoming a, a codified system along with Dragon Town, mm-hmm. and um, it's like a classic Firefly scenario where you're uh, a member of a spaceship, a starship crew, and shit's always going sideways. You're trying to survive. Maybe you're trying to escape this evil empire or whatever. And um, again, it's it's about resources. It's about uh, um, connections between the different characters and also a connection to the ship you know Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we made for that setting is a ship generator and this wasn't in the original uh no one owns the sky but this is in the the one that will be in the um big red ugly and you can basically design your ship right and it could be a a hunk of junk or a state of art uh, you know um machine but the cool thing is is that you're Managing resources not only individually but collectively to keep the ship going and all that other stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Find a ship, find a crew, keep flying. Hopefully, you don't die. Exactly. Yeah, no one owns the sky, mm-hmm. right? You know, it's kind of that uh, great mantra that you know that intro song to fire the Firefly series. Um, that's what really got me thinking about. It. I was like, hey, this would be a really awesome game. And I think somebody else did it as well, uh, besides the actual Firefly role-playing game, um, which is actually called, what, Serenity or something like that? Um, um, there's two. Remember. There's two. Cortex? Oh, is there two? Okay. There was the Serenity one, which had, which um, was, in a weird, was in a weird spot where they could not use any still... Because of the, it's because of the fact that the Firefly TV show was owned by Fox, but, the, but Fox didn't produce the Serenity movie. Oh, okay. Mostly because, well, I could do it. I've mentioned this in the past. I could do a four-year class on all of Fox's dumb moves. <laughs> or 
um, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure a whole class could just be dedicated to um, Alien Three. <laughs> yeah. Just to, just to use one, just to use one example. Uh, another another one would be all would be all of the stuff that that um, the developers of the Simpsons wrestling weren't allowed to do, even though they're <laughs> even though they were in the show. Yeah. Like they not being allowed to have not being allowed to have um, cartoon violence, even though even though the developers pointed out, motherfucker, there's motherfucker, look at itchy and scratchy in your own show. <laughs> But the but um then some years some years later we would get the Firefly RPG that was able to use everything and that used um, Cortex Plus which ah oh, okay I I Cortex and Cortex itself was all right but it had a lot of Savage Worlds DNA in it Cortex Plus a little bit less so yeah. And between the two, the Firefly one is the be is the better of them for it. Okay. Yeah, I always saw it. I never picked it up on both of them. Like I was just like, eh, maybe one day, you know. Because I mean, I can I can make up the rules myself to, you know, play in the Serenity Firefly universe, you know. So. I'm always a bit cautious whenever I pick whenever I pick up um, those kind of games because the one, th especially if. If somebody at my table is a fan of that particular series, um, yeah, that's when you take a big crap on it for them and be like, "All right, now anything that happened in the show or the movie doesn't exist." <laughs> well, I usually end up putting my I usually end up putting my foot down when it comes when when I so much as smell them doing an XP of a character from the source material. Yeah. Um, a big example I've used is when I is when I picked up the Doctor Who RPG by Cubicle Seven, the mm -hmm. proper one. I'm I refuse to. T I know that there is a five E take that they did recently. And the only reason I have the only reason I have it in my library is because somebody decided to gift it to me. <laughs> um, but the one but the one by Cubicle Seven. I put my foot down and I said, "None of you are from Gallifrey. None of you are Time Lords. None of you have a TARDIS." You are all you are all playing as members of Unit. Hmm. The the main reason I did that is one, I wanted to avoid main character syndrome, and two, yeah. I felt that by having it in having it use Unit or Tor or Torchwood and and keeping it confined to Earth allowed me to keep allowed me to keep th allowed me to keep things grounded. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that makes sense because you you don't want one of those uh, uh, characters who, like you said, being the main wants to be the main character, and then it's all about them, and you're just and all the other players are just rolling their eyes as they're waiting for their turn, you know. Yeah, now I'm not I'm not saying that you can, that you can't do time do time lords, but I'm re I'm reminded of why Ralph Coster when he was developing Star Wars Galaxies was adamantly against putting Jedi in the game. Yeah. And the only re and he only eventually did it during the NGE era because so because SOE forced him to do it. Yeah. His reasoning at the time was that they would become an alpha class. And because of the cool factor of the Je of the Jedi that's been built up through the movies, um, people would hyper focus on that and not on any of the other careers throughout the game. And keep in mind, Star Wars Galaxies is a um, is a sandbox style game. Yeah, you know, one one where everybody's making making their own fun instead of a provided one like like a theme park style game like like um, World of Warcraft. Uh -huh. Neither one is better. Neither style is better than the other. They're just different. But yeah. when you have people hyper focusing on this one aspect. Every th the other aspects that aren't getting that much focus are going to go by the wayside. Mm -hmm. His compromise was was that you have to find holocrons and luck out at being force sensitive, but um, that was a bandage because people would start putting up maps on where on where holocrons were spawning. <laughs> of course, right? And I'm I'm pretty sure he I'm pretty sure he knew it because like. You only it doesn't take it doesn't take long before people are going to find workarounds no matter what, 
whether whether it be in get whether it be in games or in other things. Yeah. But and I get I get the feeling that that whole that whole main character thing was something that you um you guys wanted to avoid with it oh, yeah. within Rapture. It's admittedly it's harder to do that in Rapture than in some other games. Um mm -hmm. because there because there isn't there isn't really an XP that you can go, that you can go with. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and and that was the thing. Like, we didn't want like um, we wanted it to be fun as a group, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's never fun when you have that one person who's got that character who's either holier than thou or just this destructive thing that that can't be stopped by anything. And it's just like, ah, that's boring. What about like some more team play? And that's another thing too is like when we developed some of the character classes, because um, we'll get we'll offer some examples in the the character creation sheet uh, or chapter, but um, the character classes are meant to work with each other. Um, so, like if you have a spellcaster, you know you don't you're not going to be like somebody who's going to be necessarily wielding a sword at the same time. Um, you might have a, a person who's more along combat lines, and then you know somebody who needs to like schmooze the local uh, authorities is going to be a little bit different than the ma the magic user and the one ca uh, throwing around the sword and steel and stuff. And so yeah, we're trying to make it to where it's a team effort to create characters that complement each other. And can do certain things, and they can rely on each other and get through encounters without, you know, one person taking all the glory, you know. So, mm -hmm. but that's a tough deal. I mean, you look at some of the mad. If I remember watching a, a YouTube video on the the average damage of each class, and it's just crazy in, in Dungeons and Dragons, and it's just like. They're about the same, and there are a couple real strong outliers. But uh, um, one of the things we want to do is is de-emphasize total combat in the game. So combat is just one of four pillars in the game. So we've got interaction, um, we've got socializing, um, achieving, and then of course combat. And so we try to create in, in the encounters that we have in the Big Red Ugly is one in which that it, it plays to strengths it to uh, the strengths of different players at different times. And so it becomes a team effort. And um, it's been a lot of fun playtesting that because it's like it, it's cool to see characters characters and their players working together um, in a way that isn't uh, ant necessarily antagonistic. It, it's pretty cool because like uh, we, I watched uh, um, Tyler's AP group go through No One Owns the Sky and they were creating characters and they'd be talking to each other and they'd be like, hey, I'm, I'm getting ranks in this skill. What about you? And then, and then they would make their decisions as a group kind of um, putting together this team of badasses that you know mm -hmm. uh, do their thing when it when the game comes, and I think that's a really cool aspect of this this system is that um, I feel like D and D has kind of gotten away wa away from, and some systems should emphasize a little bit more than they do is this kind of collaborative process of character creation and story building and setting building and everything else. So. Um, that's one thing I try to emphasize from the very beginning in the the core rulebook that we're putting together um, and hoping to release soon is um, this notion of like you guys are playing a game together, you might as well talk to each other, might as well interact with each other when you're creating characters and the setting, and it shouldn't all be on the referee and and all this other stuff. So hopefully, I, my rant has made sense. I apologize. Mm -hmm. No, and. Don't apologize. <laughs> <laughs> like rant, ranting, ranting about these about these frustrations and how and how how that how that ends up being the impetus to to design. That's part mm. of that's part of the ethos of this temple. <laughs> All right, I like that. Because uh, nobody creates in a vacuum, and mm -hmm. 
a lot of a lot of a lot of art is in one form or another a response to other art or a response to something. Mm -hmm. uh, I've told the story a bunch of times, but chivalry and sorcery was bit was built because the guy the guy who created the game felt that D and D wasn't doing a good job representing um representing min what the medieval aspect. Mm -hmm. So it's, he decided. So it's he funny you mention that because I've got a copy of that book that I look at on occasion. I always like reading the forward because yeah, like he he hated you know uh, what D and D had done to uh, this kind of this medieval fantasy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and his and well, if you want if you want something done, you've. You've got to, you've got to do it yourself. Oh yeah. So, with that said, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the Big Red Ugly edition? So, Big Red Ugly is um, maxing out at about 120 pages. So, we're trying to keep it as how do I want to say it as concise as possible, while offering as many tools as we can in that short. Can, you know, concise space. Um, the reason being is I don't want to be lugging around another uh, Pathfinder second edition um, where it's like, what, 700 pages? I mean, I don't see a value in that or or lugging around three volumes of Dungeons and Dragons uh, books, you know, where it's like 900 pages worth of content. I think, you know, the core rules are at the very beginning of the rule book. They take up 20 pages. The rest is resources and character creation. Um, so that way, referees and their players can start playing as soon as possible mm -hmm. um, and have the resources to do so. So that way, they don't have to like wait for this next expansion or this next book or anything like that. They have it right in front of them, and they can start creating soon. So, mm -hmm. And I will be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But yeah. with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple once again and enjoy the madness that happens around here. All right, I appreciate it. It's been it's been a blast. Mm -hmm. So, and of, and of course, oh, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I like that. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>